This week on The Gadget Show, me and a bendy bike. I get to grips with the homemade gadget trike that can turn on a sixpence. Well, almost. John takes a trio of digital SLR cameras to Africa to test them with a little wildlife photography. Tom Dunmore shows off some of the latest and best DAB radios. And we'll show you how to upgrade your PC for just a few quid. But first, a very insecure Jason. Thieves, crime and criminals. Dirty, dirty, nicking robbers. It seems everywhere you look, there are people with light fingers. Muggings and the like rose last year by 11%. And in London alone, there were 23,500 street robberies in just three months. I better get out of here. The police say the rise was caused by the things we love. The reason I'm on the telly. You see, the thieves want to get their hands on your gadgets. By carrying around brand new mobile phones, swanky MP3 players, digital cameras and gaming consoles, us gadget fans have become a mugger's delight. A one-stop shop of technology, just waiting to be ill-gotten. Figures show that the average 16 to 24 year old owns portable gadgets to the value of £5,300. Two in three have a digital camera and more than one in five carry an MP3 player. And think about this, if you're walking around with big white cans on your ears and a brand new laptop bag, it doesn't take a massive amount of imagination to work out that you're worth mugging. You may as well just be carrying a big sign. Help yourself, mate. Ah, oh, lads. Anything you like. What's wrong with you? Oh, that ain't doing. Please take these headphones. They look ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. You can help yourself, mate. Anything you like. Probably the last person will get robbed today. I tell you that. All right, gentlemen. The problem is, there's no amazing gadget that will save you from street criminals. For once, technology doesn't have the answer. You just need to be sensible and keep your kit hidden. The one place you can make a difference is in your own home. There's a whole load of technology that's cheap and easy to install that should turn your average house into a modern-day fortress. When most people think of techie home security, they think of CCTV, cameras like this 120 quid full colour model. Traditionally, they are fitted to obvious entry points and should only film your property, otherwise you have to put up signs and worry about the Data Protection Act. The feed runs straight into digital video recorders like this one with 160 gig storage. It can take the feed from four different cameras and has a motion detector so it only records when it needs to. The feed you get is easily good enough to identify a potential intruder. And the hours of darkness don't provide any cover either. The camera comes with a powerful night vision mode. But it's a costly setup. The recorder and four cameras would set you back about a grand. Much cheaper, and for my money more Bond like, are wireless IP cameras like this snappily named DCS 5300G, which has some very cool features. I've set it up overlooking the back garden, and what you're seeing on my laptop should be video streamed directly onto the internet from the server built into the camera. I can view this footage anywhere in the world, and even better, I should be able to control the camera remotely. Yes, look at that! It works fantastically well. Oh, that's a great image. Let me just... Uh... See if the movement works, because it's the movement that's the killer app. Yes, it does. Fantastic. See, one of the selling points of these wireless internet protocol cameras or wireless IP cameras is that some of them provide uh, remote movement, which obviously from a security perspective is brilliant. That can scroll around to my heart's content. The problem with any camera-based security is that you can nick the camera. What you want is prevention a way of keeping the bad guys out in the first place. And I've got just the solution. Some of you might remember, last series I installed a cheap and easy home automation setup that controlled my lights and appliances all from one central server. Welcome home. I have chosen some music for you. 
So sit back, enjoy a nice cup of coffee and relax. Well, join me later when I use that network, some cool technology and a bit of cunning to create a home security system that could be the envy of Fort Knox. <laughs> Now it's time for another of our regular guides designed to help you get the most from your gadgets. This week, how to upgrade your PC. If you take the cover off your PC, chances are that your first reaction will be one of horror and confusion. Circuit boards, wires, all sorts of delicate electrics. Ugh. But don't panic. Those innards are fairly straightforward and are actually intended to be replaced and upgraded. So if your PC is getting a little long in the tooth, rather than replacing it, you may just need to upgrade some of the bits that make it go. And there are a few upgrades you can easily do yourself without spending a fortune. Random access memory is the memory your computer uses to run the operating system and programs. It's one of the easiest things to upgrade, and it can have a big effect. 256 megabytes of RAM can cost as little as £25 and fits into one of the spare RAM slots inside your tower. Having this extra memory will make your PC run a lot faster and more efficiently, especially if you use photo and video editing software. A graphics card takes on the duty of processing all the visuals your computer deals with. Photos, video, computer games, stuff like that. Most computers come with a basic graphics card built in, but installing a more powerful one means your computer can cope with all these tasks more effectively. This card costs just £30, and again, very simply fits into one of the spare slots in the back of your computer. Upgrading your graphics card means you'll get more detailed, higher resolution pictures and a smoother frame rate, essential if you're into gaming. If your PC only has a CD drive, you really should consider an upgrade. A DVD writer will mean you can still import from and copy to CD, but you can also watch DVDs and write to them. They hold about seven times more information than a CD and as such are much more useful for backing up files. There's a whole range available for under 100 quid and to fit it, all you need to do is unscrew and pull out your old CD drive and fit the new DVD writer in its place. Remember, PCs are designed to be upgraded and you can easily give yours a makeover for less than you'd think. Digital SLR cameras are getting cheaper and cheaper. You can now buy a selection of appetising looking models for around the £500 mark. So I had to test them to see what you get for your money. Last series, when I tested budget digital cameras, I popped down the road to the West Midlands Safari Park and a very nice day out it was too. For digital SLRs though, I've been allowed to go on Safari proper and I've been sent halfway round the world to the challenging testing environment of the Amakala Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. It's 5,000 hectares of prime wildlife country where photogenic species roam free, protected and with nothing better to do all day than pose for the camera, I hope. Now, back in the days when 35mm film ruled, most keen photographers wanted an SLR. The reason for that was what you saw through the viewfinder exactly matched what was recorded on the film. That was because the image made by the lens is focused onto this mirror and then reflected through a prism in here directly into your eye. When you press the shutter, at the last moment, the mirror flips up out of the way and that same image is exposed on the film which runs through the back of the camera. And that's the same whether you've got a telephoto lens on your camera or a wide angle like this one. Now you may be thinking that even the cheapest point and shoot compact digital camera these days gives you exactly what you're going to get through the LCD screen at the back. So what's the point of having a digital SLR? Well, two reasons really. One, there's still a massive range of lenses and accessories available to give you exactly the shot you want. And two, nothing beats an optical viewfinder for composing the perfect shot. Now digital SLRs work in much the same way as film ones, except instead of a film running through the back, you've got a 
digital sensor. But there is a small difference, which I shall explain. Now, this is the view we want to take a picture of here. And imagine these steps of the lens. These sticks here can be the image produced by the lens, which is either going to be recorded on the film or on the digital sensor here, which is all well and good, apart from the fact that the 35 millimeter film is actually bigger than the sensors fitted to most digital cameras. So, whereas with the film camera, we get the whole view in, with the digital sensor, we just get the center part of it. So, you can find that on a digital camera, a lens doesn't necessarily give you the shot you'd expect. Let's go, let's go. I'm testing three cameras. First, Nikon's highly acclaimed D50. We've often featured its sibling, the D70, on The Gadget Show, but for this test I've chosen the D50 because it's lighter, cheaper and has nearly all the same features. Then there's an offering from the other big player in digital SLRs, Canon. Their light and capable EOS 350D has arguably won even more praise than the Nikon. And finally, there's an Olympus, the E500. Olympus claim their digital SLRs are better because their system is digital from the ground up and has nothing in common with their old 35mm film cameras. Each camera has a standard zoom lens, but to capture close-up shots of the animals, I've also borrowed some top-spec telephoto zoom lenses from the manufacturers. I'm told that one of the best times to be up to find wild animals for safari wildlife photography is dawn. So we've got up at dawn uh, and the light is fantastic. But whether the cameras will be able to catch that is going to be quite interesting. Photographers call the hour after dawn the magic hour because there's a soft light that brings out subtle colours in the landscapes. The Nikon and Canon both have slightly bigger sensors than the Olympus, and in theory this means that in low light the Olympus might not cope as well. But in actual fact, its pictures seem to come out best under these conditions, with more natural colours. Actually, the viewfinders on all these cameras are a bit of a disappointment. If you're used to an SLR film camera, uh, they're much smaller, much dimmer, actually, I think. Um, I wouldn't like to use any of them to focus uh, manually. Of them all, the Nikon's probably the best, and it certainly has the best display of information. You get everything you need clearly and brightly displayed at the bottom, which is a great help, actually. As the day progresses out on the African savanna, the sun gets very bright and very hot. To keep cooler, animals like these antelope graze near small bushes, which means they don't overheat, but also means I'm getting a lot of contrast in the pictures. The antelope also are in shade, so you've got to judge the exposure in the dark of the animal versus the background, which is very light. Um, and it's even more difficult with digital than with film, particularly print film, which gives you tolerance of a wider range of light. Um, so uh, it's very difficult to expose without getting the background completely burnt out. We'll have a go. The detail on pictures is critical. The Canon and the Olympus both boast eight megapixel sensors, while the Nikon only has six. Surprisingly, this seems to make little difference to the end quality of the photos. So, actually, with the Olympus, the actual display in the viewfinder is quite hard to see, although you can compensate slightly by putting the putting the info screen on, which is very comprehensive. The only problem is you don't actually see it while you're taking the picture. The other problem with it is if you try and take several shots in succession, the buffer seems to fill up very quickly. It seems very small in size, so you can often, you're losing the shot you want because it's thinking about storing the pictures, which is very frustrating, certainly compared to the Nikon, so. just spotted a lion over there. So we've turned the engine off, stopped the car, and we've got to be as quiet as possible and keep our arms inside the vehicle and take pictures at the same time, obviously. The lion's hidden in the bush to devour its kill. But with our long lenses, we can get close enough to see the flesh. The Nikon and Canon lenses both have image stabilization, which means you can use a longer shutter speed without getting any camera shake. 
Olympus don't do an image stabilizing lens, but their smaller sensor means you can have more compact lenses, allowing larger maximum apertures and hence faster shutter speeds. It looks spectacular out here, but it's also very dusty. And dust is a significant problem for digital SLRs. Every time you change a lens, dust can get into the camera and onto the sensor, causing little marks on your photos. It wasn't such a problem for film SLRs, because every new shot meant a fresh piece of film. But with digital, the sensor stays there all the time, and cleaning it can be quite tricky. Now, Olympus claimed to have found a way around this problem. They fitted a transparent membrane in front of the sensor, which vibrates every time you switch the camera on, and it theoretically throws off the dust. Now, it's hard to tell during just a few days filming whether it works properly, but I haven't heard anyone with an Olympus SLR complaining about dust, so maybe it really does work. Back to the animals. And if you happen on a little chap like this and want to take a quick photo, you can use the camera's simple point-and-shoot modes that they offer alongside full manual control. Most detailed settings are altered in the menus. The Canon's menu system is the easiest and clearest to use, while the Olympus is the most complex, with seemingly endless options to choose from. You can review your shots on the screens of all the cameras, but none give you a live image as you take the picture. As yet, you can't get an SLR that offers this facility at this price. All these cameras are very good indeed and capable of producing fantastic pictures, and I think it's very hard to choose between them. The Canon is probably my least favourite, and whilst the Olympus has great technology and in some conditions definitely produce the best-looking pictures, I think for all-round ease of use, speed and image quality, I'd have to plump for the Nikon D50. Now it's time for our regular look at some of the coolest gadgets around. This week, the latest DAB radios. Here's Tom Dunmore with the critical list. Radio may be the best part of 100 years old, but that doesn't mean it's stuck in the past. In fact, quite the opposite. The arrival of digital audio broadcasting, or DAB, has led to a revolution in radio. This Roberts revival might look like the sort of radio your gran used to have, but beneath the vintage leatherette lies a cutting-edge heart. On top, it's got this LCD display. This will show you the station that you're listening to, the show that's currently on, and even the record that's playing, or even, in this case, the news headlines. It also has this red button which takes you direct to Classic FM. That's one of the few stations that broadcasts in better than FM quality. You also get a Pause Plus button, which allows you to pause and even rewind whatever you're listening to. This is the Pure Oasis, and it's a digital radio that's designed for life in the great outdoors. It's really solidly made with an aluminium frame and waterproofing around all the dials and the ports to make sure that it keeps on going no matter what the weather. It has a built-in rechargeable battery that will last for 15 hours, which is really good for a digital radio. And if you do go camping out of range of a digital signal, don't worry. You can just use the auxiliary input, plug in your MP3 player, and you'll still have tunes. This is the Freeplay Devo, and it's the world's first wind-up digital radio. It uses the same wind-up technology that Trevor Bayliss invented to bring radio to the remotest regions of the world where there isn't any electricity. It's really easy to use, you just wind it like this and after a while you get enough power to listen to the radio. But the problem is that one minute of winding like this will give you just three minutes of digital radio. That's compared to 20 minutes of FM. I think I'm going to be doing this for a while. The audio from Morphe Richards might not look like anything impressive, but actually, it's the most cutting-edge bit of radio kit out there. And that's because, as well as being able to pause and rewind DAB broadcasts, you can also record them to a memory card using the electronic program guide. Here's how it works. You stick the card in the side and then press the electronic program guide button. That brings up a list of available channels. I click through 
and then it shows me all the shows that are on for the next week. Now from those, I can choose whatever I want to record. I'm gonna go for Tom Robinson's show. It then gives me a little bit of blurb about the show. That's the one I want to go to, so I'll click record there. Now here's where it gets really good. You can not only record this once, but you can set it to record every weekday. So there you go. I've clicked that to record and make sure that I won't miss any Tom Robinson again. It's like Sky Plus for Dab. It's a really easy to use intuitive system and I think it's a great leap forward for radio. Gadget Show, we all have our own niche, an area that we specialise in, you know, stuff that we like doing. Me, I like a bit of action. The Sea-Doo 3D was a particular favourite of mine, a sort of Transformer-style wet bike which let you drive from three different positions. Unfortunately, not all of the forms of personal transport I've tried have been quite so well developed. In fact, some have bordered on the comical. This was the hover bike. We tested it in Series 1. Its makers had told us that it could well be capable of setting a speed record. They talked of figures around 60 miles an hour. It certainly looked the part. The problem was it never quite reached 60 miles an hour. In fact, I'm not actually sure it ever reached 10 miles an hour. Things didn't get any better last year when I flew to Holland to test drive the bizarre wheel surf. When we arrived, there was an awful lot of fiddling and fixing going on, but eventually, the wheel surf was declared to be working, and I duly climbed on board. And, to be honest, I wished I hadn't. It was almost impossible to control, and even after I'd got to grips with it, it just wasn't at all exciting to ride. Oh, and I fell off and ripped my jeans. I've had my fair share of disappointing rides on the gadget show, but today, I'm a little bit more hopeful. I'm back in the saddle because I'm testing this, the R8. This three-wheeler has been 20 years in the thinking and two years in the making. The inventor believes it could be the solution to our congested roads because it's narrow, easy to park, and unlike most small vehicles, it's stable. This is because the back wheels tilt, not just a little, but a long way. They can go as far over as 45 degrees without the R8 tipping. This tilting party trick comes from the clever technology which allows the mechanical bits of the bike to stay in position whilst the wheels lean towards the ground. To show how it works, we've set up a little test between the R8 and a monkey bike. The R8 turns even tighter than a London taxi, whilst even a small bike has to veer out to the side. The R8 is through the cones without a hitch, but our biker has to put his foot down to avoid falling over. Time for me to try it out in the freezing cold on a private country road. Into gear. OK. And away you go. Oh, that is very strange. If you're used to riding a motorbike, you have to make it lean. So on this, it automatically leans. It's actually not as noisy as I thought either. Very smooth. The trike is road legal, and because it's a three-wheeler, you don't have to wear a helmet or harness. But if you were on the public highway, you'd be wise to wear protective gear. I've only been riding it for a couple of minutes and I really feel as though I'm getting the hang of it. It's changed down. Around the corner. Yee! Obviously it's a prototype and there's no suspension at the front so it's, it's quite hard but if it went into production and it was slightly smaller and slimmer, some good suspension, I could really see this catching on. Everyone knows that an Englishman's home is supposed to be his castle. But these days, burglars are having a field day with all the tasty, high-priced, low-weight gadgets we're filling our homes with. But I've decided to fight back. And with the help of some pretty cool technology and my fully networked home, I should be able to turn my house 
into a modern day fortress. On this table are what I consider to be some of the most innovative devices in home security. All of them are compatible with my home automation system and all of them are easy to fit and very affordable. I'm going to use a few devices I've discovered to add a bit of extra security to potentially vulnerable areas I've identified around the house. First up, the garden fence. Let's get that. Thanks, lad. I'm going to fit an invisible tripwire using these two devices. I want to place this one roughly in that position, except upright, and then just along this fence here, I'm going to put a bit of wood at the end and put the reciprocal device so that if anyone walks between these two, if they hop up onto the fence and jump down, it should trigger this box into, one, into which one of them will be plugged to send a radio signal to my computer system and from then I can trigger whatever event I want, an alarm going off, a text message to me, sound effects, lights, fireworks, whatever you want. The box is a £21 X10 attachment to two photoelectric beam sensors. X10 is the basis for my entire home automation network and works using the electricity ring main that connects all my light switches and plug sockets. The signals are sent between devices along the existing wiring, so I can set up the beam to trigger any X10 device in my house. But more on that later. Once it's fit, it's just a matter of just experimenting and lining the two up. Another security device that uses X10 to increase its sentinel-like power is this security light. It may look like a standard setup, but when someone trips the passive infrared sensor and the floodlights come on, it too can set off a sequence of X10 events playing in my house. And they'll fool any potential breaker and enterer. I've set it up to cover the approach to the house from the bottom of the garden and placed it high enough so its sensor has a good, clear field of vision. The final bit of kit is an electronic barking dog called Rex 10. This bit's going to go outside, so I'll leave that there for now. But the actual dog sound comes from this speaker. Uh, it's got all the samples and everything inside. Uh, it's just a, a one-click solution. All you need to do is plug it in to the mains and that in turn will connect it to my whole home automation environment um, and then click it to run and press the button to arm it. As I press that you'll be able to hear it. There we go. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, this store cupboard is actually the best environment for it because it's very small and echoey and it should sound like the dog is in a room like this. It'll sound that little bit more realistic when whoever tries to break in does. <laughs> this is another area where I think I'm vulnerable. Forgive the plastic, I'm having some painting done. OK, so the idea with this thing is just like the um, dual floodlight motion detector outside. You need to put it in a place where the passive infrared screen there will be triggered at the right point. Nearly there. Done. About a minute and a half tops. Come on back in. Devil's off, listen to him. All that's left for me to do is set up exactly what I want to happen and when. Each of my security devices triggers other events around the house, all of which I can set up through this home automation software. I can have lights coming on, the radio, changing stations, anything to give the impression that the house is occupied. I can even get voice commands to ring out if I want. Hey, criminal, you are being filmed. The police have been informed. You have 30 seconds to get out. Or you can grab a microphone and record your own voice um, and save it as a WAV file or an MP3. Whatever it is, the software will then play that sound when any one of your security devices is triggered. I won't spoil the surprise by showing you what I've recorded yet. Hopefully, if it all works properly, you'll find out soon enough. To see just how good my security system is, Chris here is going to film himself while breaking in. And in turn, I'm going to film him with my night vision camera. Yep, go. The first routine was testing the Rex 10 setup. Why 
is it, boy? Is someone there? Go on, devil, get him! The kitchen light automatically coming on and then my manly pre-recorded voice makes it seem like someone's in. Route two is the back garden and my lights. Oi, what are you doing? Get out of my garden! The passive infrared sensors in the lights set off a whole list of effects that I've pre-programmed. The bedroom light comes on, then the voice command, and finally, my barking dog. The final route is over the fence, past my invisible tripwire. I've already told you once, get out of my garden, or I'll set the dog on you. Gotcha. 